thanking the TEDx team <laughs> and, and the Hub team because I came down with the flu yesterday and they've been taking amazing care of me. So I just want to thank them at the beginning. Um, so it was early 2005, about a year after I moved to Egypt, and I was meeting a friend after work. I left the metro, and I was standing on a crowded, busy street. It was daylight, it was rush hour, there were tons of cars stopped in traffic, lots of people walking and waiting for buses. If you've ever been to Cairo, you know it's packed. No one's moving anywhere. So I'm standing there waiting. My friend was late. So I'm playing with my phone. I'm fiddling with my tickets. I'm looking at my feeds. And suddenly, I feel something's not quite right. So. I look up, and there's a man staring at me intensely. And I look down right away, and then I look up again, and he's still staring at me. And I notice his pants are open, and he's walking back and forth in front of me, touching himself while staring at me. So I'm shocked, and I don't know what to do. I but the first thing that comes to my mind, I look down at myself. I check what I'm wearing. I am long, loose clothes, nothing unusual. Um, so I look around. And I'm thinking, the street's full of people. Surely someone will do something. They can all see him just as clearly as I can see him. But no one does anything. No one even seems to notice. And in fact, some of the people are even looking at me in disgust. So, um, sorry. <laughs> so I'm thinking, why is this happening? It's daylight. It's a crowded area. This is happening. There's no shame. The, the, the man has no fear. He's walking back and forth, relaxed. Um, and in Egypt, it's a place where, for years, the safety of our streets used to be a source of pride. Everyone was proud of the dignity of our neighborhoods. So since 2005, I've been collecting stories to see if there are any common themes. Even though harassment was hard to talk about back then, Almost everyone we talked to had a story. Most of the stories, though, came with reasons. Blaming the victim, not the harasser. <laughs> the, uh, some, of the, some of the reasons were told to the victim by other people. Some were implicit in their stories, like mine, when the first thing I did was check what I was wearing. And I want to share with you some of the reasons that I heard the most. Reason one, I'm harassed because I'm foreign. And the media tells Egyptian men bad stories about foreign women. OK, I'm foreign, but all of, most of the 10,000 stories we collected from women over the years were from Egyptian women. So this isn't just happening to foreigners. Reason two, I'm not veiled. And this causes men to harass me. In a 2008 study, 72% of the women who were harassed were veiled. And some of the people that we know, some of our volunteers and friends, who wear the niqab, the full face veil and black robe, say they're harassed more after they started wearing the niqab. So as convenient of an excuse as this is, a veil doesn't matter. Reason three, the bad economic situation in Egypt causes men, young men, to delay getting married. And the sexual frustration that they experience, and coupled with 
the fact that they're religious and they can't have premarital sex forces them to become harassers. Uh, Dina was 15 years old when she was molested by her doctor in his, oh, her, her married middle-aged doctor in his private clinic. He wasn't suffering from economic problems. And even more strange, over 8% of the reports that we get at HarassMap are the harasser is a child, eight years old, 10 years old, clearly not suffering from sexual frustration or delayed marriage. And no religion, not mine or any that I know of, tolerates this kind of behavior. But I'm sure that all of you have heard arguments like this before. After all, harassment doesn't only happen in Egypt. I'm emphasizing them because we at HarassMap believe that they are at the core of why this problem has gotten so much worse than it used to be in Egypt. But we also believe they're the key to change. We hear over and over again that reasons like this plant just enough doubt in people's minds that makes them afraid to take the risk to take a decisive action when harassment happens. So when they find themselves face to face with harassment, they err on the side of silence. If only we could eliminate these doubts, we could see the reemergence of a society that rejects harassers and more closely reflects our traditions and values. Like when everyone comes running out of their houses and out of their shops to help people whenever someone shouts thief. Looking at all the evidence, we believe that the only way sexual harassment will stop is if harassers stop harassing. And the only way they'll stop is if we stop accepting all these reasons. So in 2010, Inji, Emlyn, Sousen, and I, together with tech partners, launched HarassMap because we were tired of staying silent ourselves. We wanted to confront all these reasons and change the social acceptability of sexual harassment. We started as an independent group of volunteers. We had no resources, no money, no funds. We were just a small group of people who were willing to invest their time after work, working on an issue to, and hopefully changing the situation that we face every day in our own neighborhoods. And we do the best we can with what we've got. We use a combination of free online and mobile technology, and we use it to support a more traditional community outreach program in all the neighborhoods where we have volunteers. So online, we have an anonymous reporting system that lets victims and witnesses document harassment using SMS or online to address the feeling of isolation and give a voice to those who would otherwise hesitate to speak. Offline, each report receives an auto response telling victims how to access free services from NGOs, psychological counseling, free lawyers, how to make a police report, self-defense classes. And online, each report is mapped on a map of Egypt with a red dot showing what happens and where. This helps us to break stereotypes, even our own, that lead to inaction. So stereotypes like, it never happens in my neighborhood, it only happens in cities, it only happens in poor areas, in dark alleyways, or it only happens to foreign girls, or veiled girls, or even that it only happens to girls. Offline, our community outreach teams use a printout of this map, zoomed in on their neighborhoods, to prove to people in their communities that harassment is a problem, even in their own community. Most importantly, we use community outreach to tackle all of the excuses made for the harasser. To do this, our volunteers, who are about 500 men and women, about half and half, from all over Egypt and from all backgrounds, they go into their own neighborhoods about once a month, and they talk to people who have a presence in the street, shop owners, doormen, car parkers, guys on the cafe, uh, these people who are always around have the ability to set the atmosphere in the street, what's accepted, what's not. 
Our volunteers are trained to respectfully and factually answer their doubts and confront the false reasons and excuses and remind them of the old Egypt. Speaking to them as neighbors and friends, they ask them to stand against harassment by being watchful guardians and telling harassers to stop. If they agree, they can make their area a safe zone, and we give them a sticker and post their location on our website. We post them as role models so that people can patronize these safe area shops, but also follow their example in society. And using this face-to-face -face outreach together with the public campaign, we hope to make sexual harassment unacceptable and reestablish social consequences for harassers. And although we were expecting difficulties, our outreach teams report that eight out of 10 of the people they talk to in the street agree by the end of the conversation to be guardians in their neighborhood against harassers. And what makes us really feel hopeful is that every day we're getting more and more volunteers who contact us because they want to take action. They're tired of staying silent and they no longer feel it's okay to wait for someone else to solve this problem. It's not easy to go up to strangers and talk about sexual harassment, but we have so many people and groups who want to get trained to do it that we're still struggling to meet the demand. We're developing a training for teachers and students and NGOs who work in public schools and universities to talk to their students about sexual harassment. We're expanding our Safe Areas program to better equip businesses to enforce anti-harassment policies in their office shops or restaurants. We've started a safe vehicles program in public transportation, and we're building partnerships with organizations working in slum areas and in Tahrir during the demonstrations. Teams in rural governorates outside of Cairo are printing their own materials from our designs and using our online guide to go out into the streets before we even have a chance to train them. People who stood up to harassers are telling us their stories and we're publicizing them as role models so that other people can follow their example. Volunteers are blogging and tweeting and encouraging victims to speak out with the NSH hashtag on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We've worked with other groups on creative ideas like an art exhibition, live performances of our reports, open mics, anti-harassment graffiti, and a salasil, or a human chain where they hold signs in the streets uh, during rush hour and so many people, some of them groups of friends, some of them individuals, have contacted us to tell us they want to join us or they, to tell us about their own initiatives that they're starting up. We've even heard from activists in 18 other countries who asked us for help in setting up HarassMap in their country. And we're proud to congratulate Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Palestine, <laughs> on already launching their projects. And we just hired an eight-person full-time staff with seven part-timers and interns, and they're conducting research, linking up with other initiatives, improving our community outreach teams, and planning a huge public campaign based on market research to change the social acceptability of harassment. When we started, we thought the progress would be slow. After all, we're basically going door to door in a country of 85 million people that's undergoing a post-revolution <coughs> unstable period of time. But every day, more and more people are joining the struggle, and every day, there are fewer people giving reasons and more and more people taking action. And person by person, they're getting us closer to the day when we'll reach a tipping point in our streets when victims can safely speak up because they know someone will help them and not blame them or attack them. When it's the harassers who face the shame and when the police no longer look the other way or make excuses for harassers and help us to make Egypt a safe place where we can all be proud to call it our home. Thank you.